the question is, what is reinforcement learning really? Um, it's not easy necessarily to answer because um, we already have uh, deep learning and machine learning, which a lot of you will be familiar with. So what's the difference to reinforcement learning? Well, basically, RL is a technique to make a machine solve a task without supervision. So what that really means is we can give the machine a task and the machine just will learn by itself what to do and successfully perform these tasks and hopefully produce favorable outcomes. Um, so when we usually perform a task, we go through a number of steps during these tasks. So let's say in this typical reinforcement learning example, a machine would like to learn how to play a computer game. The way it works is usually the computer game starts and then we find ourselves in some gaming scenario. And while we are in this scenario, we go from one step in the game to the next. And while we're doing this, the state of the system changes, meaning what we see on the screen changes. So when we play a computer game, there's one thing uh, that is basically us. And another thing is that um, we have a screen that we look at, which is effectively the state of our system. And based on that, we respond. We make, it, we make decisions to do something uh, inside this computer game. So in other words, we act according to what we see. And then as we step through the steps, several things happening in this computer game. And finally, the game somehow ends and we end up with a success or failure based on the chain of the decisions that we made. So we may have done a lot of really good steps and actually scored some points or maybe we have actually not done very good steps and we failed in our game. So we could, for example, as a reward, win a number of points. On the other hand, we get a negative reward where we lose a number of points. So depending on, depending on what, um, what we've done, it goes one way or the other. Okay, let's go to the next step. So what this really means is we go through what we call a Markov decision process. We're basically stepping through a Markov decision process and uh, you probably, if you are familiar with this a little bit, uh, you know what a Markov chain is. So I talked about different states. So here uh, the states are uh, shown in, in those letters, A, B, C, D, E, F. We will in a little bit uh, find out how all this applies to trading. Just, just, just uh, uh, let's for a moment focus on this diagram, just, just to see what this looks like. So we basically have a state A here, and then we take an action um, and, uh, and the action uh, gets the letter A, uh, which is different from the state A. Um, so we take an action. And so, for example, we could take an action uh, along this line and we end up with state E, or we could take another action, we end up with state C, or another action, we end up with state B. So we're basically uh, having a transition from one state to the next. And then at each transition, uh, we may get a reward. And finally, in order to determine which of the states or which of the uh, actions we choose to get from one state to another, we have to have some sort of policy that determines which action we choose it and why. And so, for example, that policy could be that the action that immediately gives us the highest reward uh, would be the action that we choose. So this choice of, of uh, uh, finding a particular 
action within the set of actions is called a policy. And as we step through these, let's say we just step from here, from A, all the way to F, uh, we finally uh, get a reward. And so on each step along, we get an incremental reward and we end up with a final reward here, uh, F. Now, this is all good and well. Um, and the, our our objective is basically to maximize uh, this final reward f, and we significant uh, signifi signify this here with this little equation. Um, we want to maximize our expected reward given a certain policy and a certain state at a certain time. Okay, now um, when we when we do this, um, we basically have an issue in that, for example, in trading, when we enter a game, we're not necessarily getting a reward uh, straight away. So we're stepping through a couple of steps and finally our reward will be if we close our position in the simplest case. So let's say uh, we buy stock X and then, you know, the price goes up, the price goes down. Finally, it ends up going up a little bit and we close our position and we make a small profit. Um, so in trading, basically, what, what we can see is other than a game, our states are our market parameters. So let's say uh, we are a trader and we look at a chart. And so let's say on the chart, we have a number of indicators and, and technical uh, things. So here, you can see this, for example, we have like a trend channel, uh, which is this channel here between those two lines. And maybe we have a exponential moving average, or we have support and resistance lines. And all of these things help us to identify what state we are in with our trade. So, so in some sense, it is equivalent to looking at a screen on a computer game. So all these different indicators, for example, they tell us something about the state of our system and based of, on the state of our system, we make a decision. And decision, the decision that we make is basically one of three actions. It's either buy, sell or hold. That's pretty obvious. So we really have those three decisions in trading. Of course, we can become more complex than that if we deal with, for example, portfolios. But let's uh, start with the simplest case, uh, which is basically buy, sell or hold. And again, that, that's already uh, fairly complicated if we go into the minute details of it. So let's assume um, we are down at this point here and we go long. So we stay in the trade, we stay in the trade, uh, our prices go up and then they drop a little bit and then they go up again and they drop and then they go up again. And then finally uh, we exit our trade, let's say up here. And then we get a reward, which is the PNL of our trade. And our goal is to basically get the best reward possible. So in this case, uh, which is really the ideal case, we enter here at the lowest point and we exit at the highest point. So we get a maximum reward from this trade. Now, of course, that's the ideal world. So what's the problem here? The problem is when we are in a trade and we decide, for example, uh, to stay in the trade, even if the trade goes against us, we basically have, uh, we've, we have the scenario where we actually might lose money, but we still have a conviction that this trade will really go in our favor in the long run. And so we don't want to exit it. Now, in traditional machine learning, what we normally do is we have a state at a certain time and we give that state a particular label. And that label would be, for example, the immediate profit or loss of our trade. But the problem with this is if the trade in the immediate 
um, future goes against us, then this label is actually not really correct. So here is an example of that. Let's just assume uh, we have this very strongly mean reverting price curve. So this could, for example, be the portfolio value of a pairs trade. And let's say uh, this red line signifies two standard deviations above our mean value, which is here at zero. Okay, now let's assume we're entering a trade once we breach the barrier of two standard deviations. So for example, that would be here. Now, as it always is in reality, just because we enter a trade doesn't mean the trade exactly goes in our favor immediately. And in this case, you can see that our price curve of our portfolio moves away from the mean. And whilst we're reaching the two standard deviation uh, line and we enter a trade, we will still move further away from the mean, as you can see here. And so what that means is we're actually ending up with a negative PL, or at least a negative unrealized PL. So we haven't closed our trade yet. But we know, and this is what our experience, perhaps our backtesting tells us, that eventually this position that we entered here will revert back to the average line. So even though the trade goes against us, we're staying in the trade and we're waiting and waiting and waiting until the trade reverts and finally perhaps again breaks through this uh, line here. And once we entered here, uh, for example, in a short position, then we can exit this short position uh, at this point. Now, what that means is somehow the machine has to understand that even though the trade goes against us and we have negative or negative PL labels here, perhaps, we still have enough conviction or the machine has enough conviction to then um, stay in the trade and eventually end up uh, with a positive profit. We could also call this delayed gratification. So when we enter this trade, we're not immediately getting gratification out of this trade. We're actually seeing, oh my God, you know, we're actually in a drawdown. And then the gratification only comes later as our trade reverts back to the mean. So the question is, how do we label uh, such a decision-making process? And in traditional machine learning, that's really not that's really not easy to do, because what we would normally do is we would say, well, we come here, and then we label every step along the way with a specific PNL. And so, if our PNL just in this case goes negative. We have all these negative labels, and especially if it moves far away enough from here, we will just uh, have to close the trade be because it goes negative. There is nothing that can tell us, oh, in the future, it might go the other way again. So now we enter reinforcement learning. We apply a technique called retroactive labeling. So imagine. We build a little table here, just like this. Have a look at that. So in this table, um, we can see, for example, uh, here in this um, in in this uh, row, we have different price levels that our trade can have, and then here we have two actions: hold and sell. So what happens is at the beginning of the trade, we get into a long trade, so we buy. So the two actions that we can actually carry out are hold or sell. So at first, as we enter, let's say at $1,200, nothing happens initially. So if we, or if we hold or sell, we still at the zero level. Then at 1250, if we sell at 1250, we make $50. Uh, if we um, do hold, we make zero dollars. Then at 12.20, then the price drops a little bit. 
if we keep holding zero dollars if we sell here we end up with the twenty dollar profit and so on and then finally let's say at 1300 uh, we really uh, decide to sell if, if we don't hold anymore but if we sell we make a hundred dollars okay so that's all good and well um, but basically here when we look at the hold column we see all zeros but in some ways these columns these zeros are not they're not really real in some ways if we hold we actually have some kind of conviction that we would still be able to make some to make some money so what can we do we can actually use this equation here called the Bellman equation and instead of just assigning a zero to all of these uh, entries here we use this equation to retroactively label each one of those actions with a certain value uh, which is non-zero so let me just quickly explain this equation basically um, RSA is in some ways the table that we've seen before so we see S and A this is S is the state which is in this case just our just our um, price levels and A is the action hold or sell just a quick one um, I've got some okay wonderful I uh, just had to check something okay so now if we apply the Spellman equation here we see gamma uh, this is a, a factor which we will explain in a bit and then um, we have Q S A and Q is basically this table here so Q has um, a state which is the state of the of the future uh, trade and an action so remember this is really a way of labeling a process for machine learning and so this is not in that sense uh, a way to to move forward but basically to move backward to build a system that we can feed in our machine learning system and actually find good labels to solve this problem of delayed gratification so when we look at this equation uh, in this case we set gamma at 0 0.9 and then we have this uh, table here QSA so the maximum of those decisions or the maximum of those values we end up actually labeling each of these whole decisions here with a uh, a P and L value. So this is not a real P and L value, but an, a sort of quasi P and L value. It gives us an idea of how much our decision to hold is worth, with res, uh, as opposed to a decision to sell at this point. And so if we do this in this case, we can see that if we make a decision to hold, that decision to hold is actually worth more than the decision to sell so if we see this we can say well let's make this decision to instead of of selling uh, to actually uh, hold our stock and then finally when, when it comes to the next level here we make a decision to sell and we go to this point uh, where we actually close the trade okay so this is the Bellman equation. Now let's um, let's just uh, dissect uh, this a little bit more. So R, as you can see here, is the immediate reward of an action A. So the immediate reward is effectively the table that we've seen first, which had all the zeros in it. Q is the cumulative reward of an action A. So so that's effectively the other table. So we have a cumulative reward for each action which is not a real reward as such but it's an imaginary reward that we would get 
if we look at a specific action uh, at some point, then S, as I said before, is the state that we end up with when we perform an action. So it's actually our, our future state. And then, uh, so this is S prime, sorry. And then S is the previous state. So you can see that this equation works retroactively. We go from the future state uh, and calculate the previous state. And then we have this gamma, which is called a discount factor. And gamma is effectively giving weight to this future state with respect to the previous state. So if gamma is zero, then we can clearly see that all we have is that uh, table that we started with. And the larger we make gamma, the more we actually uh, give weight to future outcomes. So for example, if gamma is zero, then we say, well, we can either um, um, hold, which gives us a zero reward, or we can uh, sell, which gives us a reward, for example, of, of whatever that reward was that we saw in the first table. But then if we apply a high gamma, for example, uh, the one that we seen in the previous table of 0 0.9, then based on, based on our labeling, um, um, we will see that, that our reward of holding this position will be higher than the reward of closing that position. So this is really what's helping us to make decisions that are based not on a what we call greedy decision-making process, where we only look at the decision that gives us the highest reward right in that moment when we make the decision. But we're basically saying, oh, okay, even if our decision looks immediately not very favorable, we will still keep holding that position for a little while. For example, if, if the price drops and we will have the conviction that we end up with a higher reward later. So that's reinforcement learning in a nutshell. It basically helps us to make decisions based on future outcomes rather than based on outcomes of immediate actions. So the interesting thing is, in traditional reinforcement learning, we use tables as the one I've shown you, and we build those tables uh, based on what we've experienced and based on the learning process. However, in trading, for example, we have a large amount of states for example, if if we look at different indicators in the market and different you know different uh, other other influences uh, that that we might be interested in, and so we go through a lot of different states, and the complexity of our system becomes incredibly high, which means we won't be able really to build these tables anymore and store them somewhere. So what we're actually uh, wanting to do then is find another way to build these tables without having this huge complexity of creating an enormously humongous table. And this is where deep reinforcement learning or where deep learning comes in. Because basically what we can do is rather than building these, these tables for real, we approximate these tables with deep learning or in other words, neural networks. So for example, um, I just put a little diagram of a neural network here. Let's say we have four input states, um, which is, let's say a moving average a difference here. Maybe it's the relative strength index Maybe uh, X3 is some sort of candlestick chart pattern. And maybe our fourth input is the time of the day at which this trade occurs or at which the time of the day at which we see this particular state. And then everything goes to a neural network, which is effectively an approximation of our complex table. And then 
we end up with three different outputs and our three different outputs are buy, sell and hold. So this is the interesting part. We use this neural network as a proxy for these tables that we've seen previously. 